Just with the existing excess capacity, we could conceivably make $80 billion of products. Oh, $80 billion. Just in the U.S. Tino Go. Tino Go. Tino Go. Tino Go. The founder and CEO of Borrow, which is the world's first rapid manufacturing shared economy marketplace and platform. Our goal is to launch in six metro areas and achieve one kitchen per month per million people. But that will result in 800,000 in monthly sales and about a quarter million in reinvestable margin because we have no capex, we have no inventory, we have no working capital needs. Welcome to the High Performance CEO Show, your exclusive insight into the strategies and success habits of the world's top CEOs. I'm your host, Sebastian Schieke, entrepreneur, mentor, and business angel. Prepare to grow your business, enhance your leadership skills, and thrive in today's world. Let's dive in. Today, I'm talking to Tino Go, and he's the founder and CEO of Baru, which is an amazing startup. But Tino also has a huge history in the corporate world as a CFO and uh, various different roles. And uh, now we talk about his past and his transition to become a startup founder and uh, someone who's really trying to change the world for good. Tino, welcome to the show. Hi, Sebastian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for check in and uh, we just had a quick uh, pre-discussion and we talked about a restaurant here in uh, Frankfurt because you spent a significant time in Europe and Germany uh, and many parts of the world. And before we dive into your amazing, interesting startup, let's quickly uh, give us a kind of a quick overview about your, your history and the various roles you hold in the financial space. This startup is my third career. Um, so my first career uh, started right after high school where I founded a company to do advertising production. I, so despite having a couple of scholarships, I, I dropped out of school and uh, out, out of uh, university and started my own company. And that was doing logistics and, and coordination for advertising. So I was a, I was a producer um, for print and for film. Um, in Detroit and then Los Angeles and then Par based in Paris for seven years. Uh, two of those years overseeing Italy and two years overseeing Northern Europe based in Dusseldorf. And then um, I switched careers into corporate finance because uh, I was interested in learning how the world worked. For me at that time was uh, I didn't understand how recessions occurred. So um, to learn, I went back to the United States. I, I received a full scholarship to study economics at the University of Michigan and then followed that with an MBA and most of a master's of accounting and um, started working as an investment banker in 2000, but that, that industry collapsed with the dot-com bust and then 9-11. So I did turnarounds consulting for a few years and that was that was a great learning experience. I, I got to see, you know, and help uh, manage and help save companies in crisis. And uh, starting in 2004, I, I got my first CFO job. That was for a small $12 million fam, uh, family office owned company. And uh, we grew that company to $85 million in the five years I was there. So that not only was that a great experience to learn how to do my job, but also how to learn how to scale uh, companies' uh, operations and administration. Uh, my last company uh, I oversaw was a, a $1.2 billion business unit of a German chemical company. You, you probably know it, BASF. So I was there for one year uh, on a, while the normal CFO was on medical leave. And then I had this idea of... Um, of a brand new business and brand new business model, or not totally brand new, but as an, an evolution of a marketplace business model. So that's what, that's where we are now. Um, I'm building a company called Baru. Baru is a gig platform for underused manufacturing machines. That's we interesting. Sell, yeah. I mean, we sell products, but we get them made using other people's machines. Right now we're scaling with custom cabinetry. 
and uh, when we sell the, the the product, we send the machine instructions and the materials to a custom cabinet maker. And the, what makes this work is because we uh, these the machines that we're uh, tapping into, they're only in use on average two to three hours a day. So there's always capacity at the machine level. And so that's, you know, yeah, well, essentially we sell products, but uh, we also provide some value because we're sending them the engineering and machine instructions. And we're also sending them the materials so that, you know, this completely makes sense. I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a big shift from the corporate world where you have had whole CFO positions to running your own startup where you yeah, not only are uh, be the CFO, you're also the CEO and the COO, and uh, you're wearing many hats. Uh, um, but also your business idea and the concept, I mean, it makes completely sense. I mean, there's so much underutilized equipment out there. Yeah. Um, and it starts, I mean, it starts at home. You know, I live in a house with seven flats. Yeah. Everyone has a drilling machine, machine, everyone has whatever machine, you know, but we hardly use it, you know, and I now was thinking, hey, why don't we share this? You know, I mean, why do everyone needs to buy a drilling machine? Why don't we have one room where we put it in, you know, we share the costs and then uh, everyone can use it. Yeah. In a small scale, but also in a, in a larger scale, I mean, okay, the drilling machine doesn't cost you a fortune. Yeah. Uh, everyone can afford one, but if you talk about big machineries for big organizations, then these are huge investments uh, and often they are not utilized due to um, drop in demand or whatever. Uh, and then having this opportunity to basically lend out your machines, you know, to someone else uh, to produce another product and charge for it. It's a very interesting idea. Uh, I would be interested to, to learn how your customers receive this idea, this opportunity. Are they open from the beginning or um, are they a bit hesitant? Uh, does it differ between different countries? How's the feedback? Yeah, so we're only uh, building in the US right now, mm -hmm. but uh, we will in short order be in Europe because I've lived in European uh, uh, homes. And so <laughs> uh, this is a natural fit. Um, our customers, they tend to be interior designers and, and contractors. The homeowners are the payers, but our um, channel partners are designers and contractors. So, and then our supply side of this marketplace are the manufacturers. It's extremely well received. The reason why is customers, they get custom made cabinetry for 60% of the normal prices delivered four times faster. The designers, we help them avoid between two and six weeks of process work from their operations. And we pay them a commission, a commission that over the past 20 years has been eroded from their earnings base through the, because of the internet. So they're enjoying that. And our manufacturers, because we provide the machine instructions and the materials, their profit margins are double on an activity basis, they are double what they normally earn because it's as if we added another work order to their organization, as if we were internal. Yeah, you just need the idea. Yeah, I need to, I need to go a different way uh, and rethink, I mean, how things have done, have been done for decades. Yeah, and, and then, yeah, opportunities open up and uh, you just have to pick them and uh, do something. The way this idea came about was I tried to get a bookcase for my house mm -hmm. and I couldn't find it. And I discovered to get one made was a medieval process. I was shocked and I was, I found that completely unacceptable in the 21st century. In my mind, I thought um, with robotics, I thought the machine should read my mind and should start producing <laughs> the product. Yeah, right? I think we have similar expectations from <laughs> from the world. <laughs> exactly. And so that's what we've built. We've built multiple mechanisms, starting with a product configurator that will soon launch online. You know, once a client uh, agrees to the design, they can go directly to the website with their with some of their, you know, their contractors, uh, final measurements. They can order it directly online. 
that completely eliminates all of the shop drawings and manufacturing engineering of, of that drawing. And that process, the avoidance of that process saves two to six weeks. And then we have another mechanism where we can tap into the, you know, con convert desire into machine instructions. As soon as oh, we'll, we'll create digital twins of these products that designers can use in their own software. All those digital twins will be ready also for augmented and virtual reality. And we have two patents around the use of augmented and virtual reality to configure a product for digital manufacturing. So change the picture in AR or VR or in the metaverse, or even with artificial intelligence generative design, and that is ready to manufacture at a local machine. So we've eliminated all of the supply chain, timing, costs, risks, that direct connection between what you want and what a machine does also allows us to reduce the network to a village level, as opposed to the current scenario where things are mass produced overseas at the lowest possible cost. So you don't even get a good product. And then 40% of what the consumer pays is wasted on our cost of shipping, warehousing, packaging, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, it's a clever model and it's definitely a um, blueprint uh, for the future, for also for other industries. Uh, uh, we have to think out of the box. Yeah? We have to question the status quo in everything we do yeah? and, and just go different ways and, and try different methods and, uh, and strategies to uh, get what, what we need. Yeah? We can't just uh, do things in the same way we've done them for the last uh, decades, uh, not in times of AI and a changing world. Well, I mean, when I started investigating with whether this idea could be a business, I, I spent two years traveling back and forth to one of the wholesale furniture exposition markets in, in North Carolina. You know, I went four times and learned the industry and, and discovered that the industry was too tied to its existing processes and existing relationships and supply chain, global supply chain, and they couldn't evolve. And so it, that's when I decided, okay, this for this to come into the world and to, to the benefits to be shown to the world, then it had to be a startup. And over the years, as I kept testing it, as we kept proving various proof points, as we kept building it kept, you know, the finances penciled out on Excel and it kept making sense. Now we're growing, now we're scaling. So looking back at your um, previous career, you had one role as a CFO and you had a clear topic you had to, um, to deal with. Now as a founder, you oversee everything in the organization. When I talk, I have a couple of clients in the corporate world who also think about, yeah, you know, I would love to uh, do something else. But then they say, yeah, Sebastian, now I have a team and everything is taken care of and uh, there are structures and there are processes, you know, and I can't really imagine doing this everything on my own. And um, so looking at you, I mean, you are, could be a role model for them, yeah? That um, you took everything in your hands and, uh, and created an organization. What, is the, what was the biggest challenge for you setting up an, uh, a new company? You live one day at a time and you, you try to make progress every day. Mm -hmm. You know, even, even as a CFO, I was always in someone else's office proposing a different way of doing operations because that's, that's just my nature. Because I, I believe in continual improvement. So unlike a lot of um, finance professionals, I, I, I was not happy with just doing my job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, you just go, you, you go about it and you have to be uncomfortable with uncertainty for sure, because, you know, you, you can only control what you can control and you hope that you're making the right steps to move forward. And building the team, hiring people, setting up the structures. How did it work out for you? You know, I can't do everything myself. I've never been able to do everything yeah. myself. This is not the kind of a uh, startup where you can do it in your garage, right? You have to have, we're replacing an entire vertical from, from customer sale to machine code. 
And, and, and so I had to bring in people on, people that saw the same vision, people that believed in what we were doing, people that saw the economic opportunity. And I've been able to convince enough people where, we'll, you know, now we're, it's going, now we're scaling. And now as we scale, I'm still looking for new people. You know, I'm looking for, well, I'm always looking for customers, collaborators, and, you know, soon we're, we'll be launching a seed seed financing round so that yeah, we can, we can grow investors. even faster. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all bootstrapped at the moment? We've had a uh, half a million in uh, angel investment. Angel investment. Yeah. And uh, we've proven the, you know, we have had uh, sales and manufacturing operations in 30 regions around the country. So we've shown that the operations, they work. We have a million and a half in our sales pipeline for multifamily. And so we've demonstrated that we can be uh, competitive in that world. And uh, we're building this product configurator that will launch in um, about a month. And that will allow designers to do their self-service custom cabinetry. And we have two patents. Now our go to market is as we wait for these multifamily projects to be scheduled and start executing, we also want to tap into the interior designers and contractors with the investment. Our goal is to launch in six metro areas and achieve low penetration, one kitchen per month per million people. But that will result in 800,000 in, in monthly sales and about a quarter million in, in reinvestable margin because we have no capex, we have no inventory, we have no working capital. Exactly. Needs. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. The beauty, no, on your business of your business model that uh, there's no no hardware needed apart from a couple of uh, notebooks you use for development. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, just plays it, no, yeah. The other day, I calculated for uh, someone had a question. I I calculated how much excess capacity there was. Just with the existing excess capacity, we could we could conceivably make 80 billion dollars of products. Oh, 18 billion dollars. Just in the US. And are you planning to, I mean, now it's cabinets, kitchen shelves, etc. Are you also planning to go into different segments in the long run? Yeah, in the long run, certainly. Uh, this is just about digital manufacturing and satisfying, uh, satisfying customer demands. But in the, in the medium term, Our goal is to maximize use on these of this one class of machine, because as you know, because as we go from the average current utilization of two to three hours a day to say ten, the costs of that machine will drop fivefold from two hundred dollars an hour to forty dollars an hour, and the the owner will continue the benefit. And so the way we increase utilization is by You know, the digital twins can all of a sudden be in, in the in the software as large contractors are built designing during the planning phase of a design. Well, by doing that, you've eliminated so much of the coordination and communication costs around anything that we can touch, which is generally interior interior furnishings. How does the organization look? Are you running a virtual team? Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, um, it's always interesting for the listeners to get a bit of a background and how large how large is uh, your organization at the moment? Yeah, so uh, I was forced to run a virtual team because um, I wasn't able to find the same, the talent and the desire within a 50-kilometer radius. So the team is uh, currently uh, four, me and three others, three colleagues. A manufacturing engineer, a software engineer, uh, running an offshore team for the software, and then fractional CMO. I'm asking this question because I have the same setup. I run a virtual team because I can't find the skills uh, around where I live. Yeah, And I also want to be flexible where I live and where I spend my time. Yeah? But there are still uh, many C CEOs around who um, are still thinking, yeah, they want to have a team in the office. They want to have a team coming to a place. And, and But it's, I think it's uh, interesting to learn that it's also working the other way around. You know, it's uh, 
virtual gives so much benefits uh, for our kind of businesses? Yeah, it's 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 great, but uh, I had you and I have the advantage of uh, starting the organization. I think it would be really difficult to migrate, to transform. Yes, there is benefit in being face to face. Definitely, yeah. And you know, even being in the same office, you know, you walk by someone's desk and you can instantly understand what's going on. Oh, yeah, this yeah. person's busy. This person's stressed. This person, yeah. um, or this person has some time for chit chat, and you go walk over and say hello, and 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 ideas, you know, serendipitously generate. You have to schedule these events. I mean, we, for example, we schedule a um, Friday evening social get together where we share a glass of wine and just have a normal conversation, not uh, work related. I have uh, check in meetings, quick check in meetings every day. Yeah, a quick five to 10 minute uh, call, say, hey, all right, fine, what's the plan for today? And then um, people do their work. So um, we need to structure also when you operate virtually because as you said you know you just can't go by and and uh, have a coffee or have a, a chat with someone um, but on the other end the advantage is that um, skills are um, much better available and especially for startups and also um, affordable when you um, recruit worldwide right so how do you see Bauru, um you said okay you now focus on US market, then probably Europe, the next continent. How long is your, your time frame for uh, setting up your organ organization in Europe? Probably uh, in 24 months. So if we achieve, say, 800,000 in a month, that will lead to, you know, with, with some early lag and some uh, more intensity at the end of 12 months, it'll be, say, 7 million in revenues. You know, and then and our goal is to be every in every metro area because it costs us nothing to be everywhere. So if we if we achieve a penetration of uh, one kitchen per month per uh, one kitchen per week in the top sixty metro areas, that will result in three hundred and fifty million in sales and about a third of that in in reinvestable margin. But well before then, we'll be international. We'll be in other categories. We'll have of quite an evolved software suite that will help our clients do their jobs much more efficiently. And that's part of the stickiness. You know, um, will be actually project management software that will be linked to their design soft design process. So that's just with cabinetry. You know, three say 350 in the US, another 150 in Europe, another 150 in Japan and that's with one type of machine. And then uh, we've already uh, met with the Department of Defense that was interested in our patented technology. This patent allows any soldier to create a custom part to fix a vehicle, to fix something. Well, plenty of opportunities. Interesting future ahead. Um, sounds uh, really uh, exciting what you're up to. Yeah, can't wait to... Um see you launching in Europe and checking out where I can get my next uh, kitchen cabinet from. Yeah. <laughs> One of the companies that we spoke with is is doing the um, retail stores. They were they were redoing the Adidas stores worldwide when I spoke to them. And um, the whole process of connecting the design phase with the local machine drives huge efficiencies in that process. I, I fully expect that uh, Baru's business model will be copied by other companies in, in other industries and in even in our industry, right? Uh, but that that's what I find really exciting too, because it's it's complete process shift from old global supply chain mass production principles to everything is custom made for every single customer through digital means. And, um, and more cost efficient and hugely much more environmental. Yeah. And more individualistic, you know, you don't have the same uh, cabinets in every second home. <laughs> and so that's what's exciting. Amazing. Great. Hey, is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? Anything we didn't touch on? No, uh, maybe I'll repeat. I'm looking to meet with interior designers and, uh, and contractors and, mm -hmm. um, 
or collaborators of any any anyone who's interested in talking, they should. I, I'm happy to speak with them. Yeah, and then also investors. Of course, any investors. I mean, very interesting business model. Can only highly recommend. It's changing the way things are done and uh, uh, in a more um, sustainable way. Tino, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story. It was a pleasure having you here on the show. Likewise, thank you. Thank you for tuning into the High Performance CEO Show. I'm your host, Sebastian Schieke, and it's been a pleasure serving you. Please subscribe to our show on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Your support helps us reach more listeners and create a bigger impact. Check out our website, sebastianschieke.com, for additional resources. Until next time, be bold, be exceptional, be outstanding, be a leader. Oh,